Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Mirror of Intimacy webinar. I'm Dr. Alexandra Katahakis, and today is Monday, May 2nd, 2022. Our topic today is emotion. Uh, there are a few things I'd like to mention before we get started. I want to remind you to type your questions into the Q&A box, and I'll answer them as we go along. And also to please leave us your book review or comments on Amazon for Mirror of Intimacy. Let us know what you love about the book. Um, even if it's one line or one word, we always appreciate hearing from our readers. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel by clicking on the blue subscribe button below so you never have to miss a post. You can also keep up with what we're doing by following me on Instagram at Alex Katahakis or at Center for Healthy Sex. So that's all our business for today. Also want to remind you that um, any book I mention or specific um, thing that has a URL attached to it will appear in the chat box also so that you can um, explore further on the topic. So let's look at our quote for today from Deepak Chopra. He says that sex is always about emotions. Good sex is about free emotions. Bad sex is about blocked emotions. Our emotions well up from our circumstances mood du jour or relationships and are accompanied by feelings. So I wanna just go back to the quote before I expand on that. Um, so our emotions well up from our circumstances and that is partially true, but our emotions are alive and active in our body all the time. And yes, our circumstances will activate them further, but we're always feeling emotions in the body. And good sex is about free emotion. So good sex is about um, your heart being open, you having good heart rate variability, not being stressed out or fearful or in pain about something. And bad sex can come about when our emotions are blocked, when we don't feel open hearted. And often that's because we're not really being true to ourselves, meaning we don't really want to have sex in the moment, but we're doing it anyway, or we're shut down, or we're using it maybe for um, a panacea because we feel scared or lonely, which could work possibly. Um, and does sometimes, but uh, this is sort of a simple quote that good sex is about free emotions and bad sex is when our emotions are blocked. But it is important to note that emotions do come from our circumstances, um, from the mood that we're in or whatever relationship we happen to be in in that moment. And then they're accompanied by feelings. So feelings are a more cognitive word. If I say that right now I'm feeling good or I'm feeling scared or I'm feeling lonely, by the time I've made that distinction um, that I'm having that feeling, it's quite late from when it was registering deep, deep into the body. And consider that neuroscientists today consider the body the deep unconscious the body, not the brain. Um, the, the brain houses what we've historically or classically known as the unconscious, but it's the body that registers what's deep, deep, what happened early on um, and that perhaps even hurt us early on. So emotions um, and feelings are not synonymous. They are different from each other. So feelings are a subjective reaction. Um, and they can be positive or negative. They can be strong or mild. They can be pleasant or unpleasant, or they can be really basic emotions, um, which are not so basic because some people can't actually experience them, such as joy or anger, love and hate. Um, and they're really basic emotions that we feel. Um, there aren't a whole lot of them. And many, many mammals all share these same basic um, emotions of rage, love, panic, fear, um, grief, loss, things of that nature. So we never know when our emotions um, are going to turn to feelings, when they're actually going to show up. But the visceral energy um, that they pour into our bodies demands that we mobilize them by expressing our feelings. So there is a demand and in a healthy um, living organism, there is a circuit of 
emotions that arise into feelings that arise into an expression of them. And when that is cut off because of early childhood um, neglect or abuse um, or pains that go along with that sort of thing, we can feel blocked. We can feel like we can't access our feelings, that we don't have emotion about anything, that we feel dead or dull at the core. Um, someone writes, okay, that's not, sorry, the question's not clear, but I think the gist of it is that um, you're saying that you openly work on expressing your emotions when you can, but your traumatic past really controls your ability to do that. And that's really where um, working with a good somatic psychotherapist is crucial to helping um, direct us into the landscape of the body. So if we were to do a simple exercise right now, I would ask you just to take a moment and maybe even close your eyes and ask yourself, what am I noticing in the body right now? Just what am I actually noticing? So not what am I thinking or feeling, but where is there tension, tightness, awareness? And typically we notice these feeling states in our chest. So does your chest feel open or closed or tight? What about your solar plexus, the area just below your chest? And then see if you can track into your belly, because that's often where we feel much, much deeper emotions, where we can feel nauseous or disgust or really fear or terror. And sometimes we can feel arousal in our genitals when we're scared or terrified also. And that's how for some people, uh, when they're sexually abused, that sexual abuse gets fused with terror or pain or shame. And then that can get repeated in one sex life over and over again. So you may also wanna notice the larger muscles in your body, what's happening in your thighs or your arms. This is what we call the striated muscles. And if your feelings are close to the surface, you will notice them in your limbs. So maybe your leg is shaking or you've got tension in your hand and your arms. That's a much easier expression because it's available to us. But when affect is buried deep in the gut, it's much harder to get to and much scarier. And you don't want to um, start pushing on yourself to feel something just because you're blocked. It's better to just notice that you're blocked and hang out with the blockedness. And the act of just being with the place where you're blocked starts to loosen those defenses just a little bit. But these are simple ways that you can start to track into your body and notice what you're feeling and getting acquainted with these emotions so they don't seem so foreign or so scary. Um, So I would say that expression is generally at the heart of creation. When you think about that statement, that expression is at the heart of the creation. It means to burst forward and give birth. And it's springtime now. So we see the heart of creation about to burst forward everywhere around us. We see buds on flowered, flowering plants. We see trees um, growing. I was gone for a week. And when I came home, I noticed distinctly that the tree in my family room was a little bit taller than when I left. And I would never have seen that growth had I been watching it grow all week. I wouldn't have noticed it. But um, there is an expression of that bursting forward, that giving birth um, that's alive and well in all of us if we can get these defenses out of the way. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, hello, Sarah, you write that all, when you track into your body, all you feel is rage. And so that rage is important to continue to work with 
um, with a skilled therapist that understands how to work with these bodily based expressions. But feeling rage is good news because it means you're feeling something. If you're just feeling dead or numb, um, the movement from dead or numb is into anger and rage before you start to feel a host of other feelings. So feeling anger and rage is progress from feeling nothing. Uh, someone writes, when a difficult or painful emotion comes up, how to find a balance between self-soothing and reaching out to soothe and connect with others instead of numbing through addiction, for example? Well, I don't think there's any right way to do that. Um, I think it's always helpful that when you feel emotions coming up, um, that you have somebody that you can process that with, that you can talk to about it. So sometimes if the emotion isn't too strong or overwhelming, you can find ways to soothe yourself and to notice, you know, I really feel sad right now, or I feel lonely um, and I just want to cry. So I'm just going to let myself cry. And if you cry for a minute, two minutes, three minutes is a very long cry. You'll notice that by just allowing whatever expression is to come up, whether it's tears or anger, that it doesn't last that long. And then you can do something to make yourself feel a little bit better, whether it's having a cup of tea or going for a walk um, or brushing your hair or taking a hot shower, it doesn't matter. All of those things tend to regulate the nervous system. Ideally, if you're in a program of some sort and you can pick up the phone and call someone who will listen to you, talk about your sadness or your anger, and they can just be there for you, that's also incredibly curative and helpful. So both of those strategies are useful. Uh, someone else writes, I noticed that my arms were tightly crossed in that exercise. I felt an inability to relax or let go. This is often how I feel in sexual situations with a partner too. So I would encourage you then when your arms are tightly crossed to exaggerate that tightness, really lean into the tightness. What is the tightness saying? Um, if you exaggerate it at some point, it will release. But if you notice you're doing it, the other option you have is to say to yourself, I'm going to drop my arms right now and see what else I'm feeling in this moment. And not, you know, just sit there with that defense when you're aware of the defense. So try different strategies, either leaning into what's happening or seeing if you can um, stop the block of what's happening. So as someone wrote earlier, many of us have ingested these long-standing internal messages from our families of origin that tell us to swallow our, swallow our feelings or not to bother others with them, uh, to keep a poker face or a stiff upper lip, or um, you might've grown up in a family where you know feelings were just swept under the rug, so to speak, and um, no one was really available um, to hear you out, to see you, to understand what was going on with you. And that sort of repression <clears throat> begins to shut down vitality states in the body, uh, which leave us feeling empty or dead at the core. And when we feel empty or dead, we can end up with a long-term chronic low-grade depression or worse, a more clinical depression. And this is really a form of violence on the human being that we have to be able to reveal um, the depth of our experience, whether it's you know a song of joy or feeling some sort of incredible delight and excitation about something or deep despair. And I know in my family of origin, you know, feelings were allowed sort of in the middle of the road. Like if you were just kind of in the middle, you were okay, but too excited meant uh, that we were being frivolous, <clears throat> not taking things serious enough. And there was really no place for, you know, deep sadness or emotion because we had nothing to be sad about. We had everything we needed, right? We had food and shelter and um, clothing and my parents worked hard and 
Um, the electricity was never turned off. Everybody was super responsible, <clears throat> but deeper feeling states were not privileged or talked about. So that leaves us unable to connect all the way around, to connect with great exuberance, um, uh, because that, again, was thought of as being frivolous or even silly, and um, also to not connect eventually really in love with a partner, to love deeply, because shame gets swaddled around that, because if you love, then you're really going to be seen and then you can be shamed. So better to stay away from that too. So these are not um, what we would call more egregious abuses, right? In my family, my parents were mostly insensitive. They were not you know, physically abusive, sexually abusive. There wasn't a lot of raging or yelling going on or alcoholism. <clears throat> it was just a general insensitivity you know, culturally where children were to be largely seen and not heard and shouldn't have any complaints about anything. But that can be crippling in its own way. <clears throat> we see the rushing of emotions in artists often expressing themselves in songs um, or music or painting or poetry or dance. Um, I think we all love to listen to music and love to watch dancers dance. Um, and the reason we love that so much is because there's just an outpouring of emotion that comes from that, that is delightful, that we relate to. And in some cases, which wish that we, um, you know, could express ourselves. So we live vicariously through art. <clears throat> And we don't want to be quick to chase our feelings away, to reject them or to wallow in them without reflecting in them. And somebody wrote, my mother um, advised us not to trust demonstrative people. So people were, were too effusive emotionally or not trustworthy at all. And that meant you should button it down also. You should keep it quiet and close to the vest. Uh, and so we don't want to live in a place that's, um, you know, unmoderated or unmoderate where we're just extreme with our emotions, because we've all been around people like that, that are so emotive that it doesn't feel real or genuine either. It feels more uh, what we call histrionic, more self-centered, more all about that person all the time versus the person who never says a peep or doesn't express anything at all. Um, we really want to be able to invite our emotions to the surface so we can feel them and notice them and declare them and recognize that this is just emotional energy underneath these feelings. It's your soul's unique song in that moment. It's your humanity and the way you're expressing your life. And when you observe a feeling and you dive into its root, there you'll find um, emotion in the body at its very core. And that is what makes us feel alive. I can't stress this enough. This is so simple and uncomplicated, uh, but not easy if you don't have the, the orientation towards it. And that's why I took you through that simple, simple exercise of just closing your eyes and tracking into your body and saying, what am I noticing right now? Is there tightness, openness, constriction, numbness? Um, does it have a shape? Does it have a size? Does it have a color? Does it have a temperature? And just make data out of what you see. Don't judge it as good, bad, um, stuck, something's wrong with me, I'm damaged. If I asked you to look out your window right now and just surveil the landscape and ask you just to tell me what you saw, you might notice if you're in LA that it's kind of a hazy, cool spring day. It's not too sunny. It's not too gray. It's just kind of somewhere in the middle. And that's just it. If you start to judge it that it's stupid or why is it so cold at this time of year or it's not hot enough or it's an ugly day, you're going to collapse down on this scenario and you won't actually see it. 
you won't be able to experience it and you won't be able to appreciate it and therefore be in gratitude for the fact that you're even alive on this day um, and that you're not in the Ukraine on this day, that everything is just fine right here and right now. So practice this form of noticing every day, every minute of your day, when you look outside, when you see your pet, when you're crossing the street, notice the tension in your legs as you move your legs, as you cross the street. Um, notice the way your arms swing. Notice the feeling of the sun or the breeze on your skin. And just notice it. And you will start to cultivate this capacity uh, for what we call interoception, interior, what's happening internally. We spend so much time looking outside of ourselves, externally noticing what's going on, and then running some uninteresting story in our head all the time about who said what to whom, or who's going to say something to me, or what I'm going to say back. And we're just spinning around in our head, and we're missing the direct experience of being alive, which is really what interoception gives us. Um, <clears throat> someone says, how do you live in the world when you are open and expressive? Um, I would say you live there in a very full and beautiful way. Um, and being open and expressive does not mean that you're without filter. It doesn't mean you just say whatever's on your mind at all times by insulting people or overly sharing or any of that. You just notice and you're willing to have your heart break a thousand times a day because you see a homeless person on the street or several if you live here in any given day and you feel a moment of pain or sorrow for those souls that are um, all over the streets of Los Angeles right now. It's painful, but it's alive. And that experience of pain is so much better than just feeling numb or dead or looking past those human beings. It means that you are able to put things into perspective for your own life and be in gratitude also. Someone writes, I'm very proud of myself for the awareness that I have around these things in my life I'm working on, but I struggle so much with what to do with that awareness. I feel the need to fix it. It's almost like the awareness makes it harder, if that makes sense. Well, yes, it does. Because as I said, you're not dead or numb to what's going on in the world around you. You're poignantly aware of what's going around around you. And you can't fix it. You know, Carl Jung said, if you want to change the world, you start by changing yourself. And so it's through this awareness, through this way of touching other human beings every day, when you go to the grocery store and you're buying eggs or whatever, and you make contact with the person behind the counter, you see them, you say hello to them. When you say, have a nice day, you actually mean it because you're looking at them and into them. That sort of connection is deeply curative to everybody. And in that moment, you've given service, you've given your heart, your open heartedness, you've seen that human being. And that may be the one and only time they're seen today. Um, you say thank you to them. I connected this morning with a man in a parking garage who just simply takes the ticket and puts it in the machine. And he was smiling and cheerful. And I met him with that. And that moment of meeting that eye contact with him was just beautiful. Um, I'll probably remember him throughout my day today because he really came forward and met me. And that meeting between two human beings is just beautiful. And I'll never see that man again, but we had a lovely connection. Um, and that stayed with me and will probably stay with him too. And that's likely how he makes a job that's probably rather dull um, come alive for him on any given day. So see if you can be open with your heart and giving and not guarded with it. And if you meet people that are toxic or dangerous or not so safe, then you set what Pia Melody calls an internal boundary. And she makes a distinction between, can you set an internal boundary and you know what that feels like so you're not so permeable um, as opposed to walking around with a wall all the time because you wanna keep yourself safe and not feel anything. <clears throat> Hi, Jeff. 
Um, so Jeff writes, the only feelings I had growing up were fear, rage, and frozen inside. When I started recovery, it was a complete restart of what feelings were, how to identify them, when they were showing up in my body it was all new. Then I had to learn how to express them to others, which took 20 years. Now I'm 50 and having such a great time with myself, plus my feelings that I'm feeling avoidant. For the first time on my own teddy bear, dating and letting someone else into this warm, safe place equals anxiety advice, please. <laughs> well, congratulations. That is an unbelievable trajectory and one that does take a lifetime. So this avoidance... <clears throat> is something you want to work with also. And all of these processes sort of transcend the previous one, but include the previous one also. So you're building integration. These are building blocks is a way to think about them, but it's much more nonlinear than that. So this is where choosing well comes into play. This is why it's so important to take your time to get to know someone and to start to realize that you can have gradations of friendships. There are people that um, you can trust your life with, that you know are safe, that they will go to the mat for you and that you can become very vulnerable with and surrender to. And if you have one person in your life where you feel that way with, then that's fantastic. And that could be a sponsor, a therapist, um, a close friend, a partner, someone you know has your back through and through. And then from there, um, there are different levels of friendship. So there are people that you can laugh with, uh, that you can go to a movie to, but you're not so sure you want to sit, um, share your deepest, darkest secrets with, but you love them. They're bright and creative and intelligent. Um, so you enjoy their company. And then there are other people that maybe you've known a really long time, but you don't have anything in common with. And what keeps you together is history, but you wouldn't necessarily trust them um, with much of anything other than to maybe leave them with a house plant when you go away for a week on vacation and you trust that they'll water that plant. So these are circles of intimacy um, and you want to look at those circles and who's in them. And it's through that process that you start to see like who your friends really are and where you can um, connect and feel safe. But you have to form these different gradations of friendships. And then when you're dating, you have to have a sense of what you're looking for in this person and notice when somebody is guarded or they're putting on their best um, sort of act um, as opposed to their real and you're connecting with them. But you must, must go slowly because otherwise you'll miss the cues and you'll miss the yellow flags and the red flags if you don't. Someone else writes, I feel as though as a woman, I've locked all of my feelings in my womb. I actually don't even know how to start unlocking that. Well, that would require definitely a good somatic-based psychotherapist um, that you can start to build trust with that can have you start to dive deeply into that feeling in your body um, and also where you feel locked up. Okay, so as I was saying, when you observe a feeling, you really want to dive deeply into its root. So this writer was saying that she feels these feelings mostly are locked in her uterus, in her womb. And that would be a place to dive into deeply. And that would also be a terrifying place to go. So that's not the place to start, which is why it's good to go with a trusted guide like a therapist to start to notice what's there, to feel the tightness, the tension, the muscle guarding. But there you will find an emotion in the body and you'll find the core of it wherever it's located. Um, oftentimes it can be in our genitals if we were sexually abused. Um, it can be in the gut, in the, the chest. Um, it's all there. And the inherent wisdom of your body is really the true north of your compass. It points you into the direction of deep insight into your reality, and quite possibly you could say into the nature of life. 
um, because it's in that reality that you start to unlock and start to feel. And literally what's happening is connections are being made again in the brain circuits that were previously uncoupled. And so there's a recoupling process from the higher portions of the brain down into the body. And that's where these vitality states start to come alive from again. Uh, Kate says, I'm in recovery from sexual anorexia and SLAA for 18 months. Congratulations. Um, I would like to explore allowing my emotions to be expressed through sex freely. However, also, I would like to choose a partner who is potentially a future mate. I'm 30 and I would like to have a baby in the next couple of years, God willing. Should I wait until I've gotten to know a potential lover slowly? and assess my options a little more logically for their safety, trustworthiness. I would say 100% yes. Um, you want to be very careful um, that you're in a fragile state right now. You are in um, a recovery state. You're opening your heart. You're starting to trust people again, uh, presumably women. Um, and if you are going to be dating males, you want to be careful that you are choosing someone well. And I think you should ask extremely explicit ex questions of people uh, because what do you have to lose? If somebody's so offended by that question, they're not the right person for you anyway. So this doesn't happen on the first date, obviously, but you should be able to, as you start to get to know someone, people typically start talking about superficial things like what you do for a living, um, what kind of music you like, what kind of food you like, if you've traveled, do you like to travel, what kind of books do you like to read, are your parents still alive, um, th things of that nature. Um, that's like the first and second date, right, to see if there's even anything in common, or more importantly, if there's chemistry that you feel with the person. And then you start to ask about former relationships. What's the longest relationship you've ever been in? Why did you break up? What are you looking for in a relationship? In your case, do you want to have a family? because I really want to have a baby. So if you're not interested in a family, not tomorrow, but if you're not interested in one, then you should stop dating that person. And this is the kind of data you want to um, gather from a person. Are they in therapy? What do they think about therapy? Are they in a program? Are they sober? If so, how long? Um, what's their backup plan? Should they get trigger and slip? So everything you need to know in order to feel safe. And you also have to be willing to be forthcoming about these things yourself um, if you're asking those questions. Danielle writes, I feel like I walk through the world in this open-hearted way as my default mode and to get my heart broken in little ways, as you describe pretty regularly, but I find that it is difficult to find many people in LA open to this type of authentic interaction. I've been seeking to increase my circle of friends with people less interested in transactional relationships and more in authentic connection. I've tried yoga and meditation studios as a jumping off point to forming these types of connection, but without much success. Do you have any suggestions for where to connect with a generally more authentic approach to relationships? Well, I would say any kind of like-minded groups um, is generally a good place. Um, also, uh, I think you said yoga and meditation studios, um, specific types of meditation. So whether you're into transcendental meditation or Vipassana or Zen, uh, there are centers all over the city for that sort of thing. Um, and then if you just meet one like-minded person who's got a like-minded friend and you start to form a friend group, that's the best way of starting to find like-minded people. Um, I would also say, you know, group therapy, while it's not a friend group, is a place to start to real reality check um, your assumptions and how you connect and what you're looking for. Um, it's a very powerful modality for healing. I think probably the most powerful in many ways. Um, so being in group therapy can be enormously helpful to constantly honing a sense of who am I? How open am I really? I think I'm open. Maybe I'm not so open. So I'm going to get some feedback um, and started. Um, oh, good. <laughs> uh, she says she joined group therapy for just that reason. So good for you. Um, so I would say that is the, the primary way. 
I have found those circles of friends in a lot of my um, groups that are study groups, they're intellectual study groups. So maybe a book group also, um, if you don't have a specific kind of study group where I have found my tribe and I have many different kinds of tribes um, because there, I have many different aspects to who I am. Um, some of them can be just people that are really um, intellectually steeped in a particular way of thinking. Um, others can be just people I have an enormous amount of fun with and laugh with. Others can be um, with uh, friends, old friends and family members. So see how much you can diversify and just connect with one person. That person will have a friend. As someone writes, I've been single and sexually inactive for eight years after a stressful breakup. I've recently heard the term sexual anorexia. Could you explain this term for me? Well, I believe you're explaining it yourself. Um, and as you heard someone say, there are 12 step groups for specifically sexual anorexia, which is the avoidance of sex. Um, sex and Love Addicts Anonymous has specifically has groups for anorexics, which you can find online. And I would encourage you to do that, encourage you to start to get out of your avoidance. Um, if it's too much for you to start to date and at least go on coffee dates and get to know people again. But eight years is a very long time. That's a decade of your life. Um, so don't delay. I know it's painful and it's scary, but it will get increasingly more painful as you age and find yourself alone and unable to connect. I've been, I think your suggestions of talking through your feeling, yet when we talk about betrayal, it's a tough area. One, many people really don't probably want to go there. And two, I'm not ready to share with friends and families. It can be so polarizing. How do I seek out healthy people for walking through this experience together? Well, I would advise you to find um, a group for betrayed partners uh, where you can talk about it as much as you want, as often as you want um, with people that are sympathetic to your experience because they have had the exact same experience. And I agree, it is polarizing to talk about it with friends and family because of the level of complexity to it. Um, sometimes it's not that easy to leave someone who's betrayed us, especially if we have a trauma bond to them. So it's necessary to find qualified people that can hear it um, and that aren't that quick to give advice. Um, and if you do repair with that person, don't also hold a grudge against them. Someone writes, I've been in a relationship for over a decade and we have a very satisfying relationship. He was recently asked me to move in and I'm questioning if this makes sense since I can't trust he is over his ex. Well, a decade is a long time. If he's not over his ex after 10 years, I don't know how your relationship can be satisfying and I don't know how you can trust that person. So I would suggest that you sit down and have a very explicit conversation um, with him or her, you said him. And um, if that doesn't go well, that you find a couple therapists that can help you negotiate that, those waters, because um, 10 years is a very long time to not trust someone. Um, Sherry's asking about what a trauma bond is. A trauma bond is when we are engaged in a relationship with somebody who is toxic who's really bad for us. They're abusive emotionally, physically, perhaps sexually, financially, and we just can't let them go um, because our trauma and their trauma are interlocking. Uh, there's a book called The Betrayal Bond by Patrick Carnes where you can look very extensively at what a trauma bond is. And he's got a test for that also, just a self-report test that you can take to see if you are in a trauma bonded situation. So let's look at the daily sex acts, healthy sex acts, as we wrap this up. When you experience a pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling, name it as such and surrender to it. Just notice it. Don't chase it away or try to change it or fix it. Emotions are the music of your soul. Share them with your partner today. Let them see all of you. Don't be afraid to just say, if someone says, how are you? We always respond with this horrible, benign, fine, as opposed to I'm great, or I feel super happy today, or I feel sad, or eh, I'm just feeling kind of blah or angry. 
um, you don't have to expound on it. Just be honest about what's true for you. And if it's unsettling to that person, that's not your problem. <laughs> Maybe you'll invite them to start to be more honest about what's true for them also. Express your emotions in your lovemaking through feelings, um, telling your partner how you feel, through words of poetry and love or guttural sounds while you're making love. Make sure you breathe and just don't hold back your full expression. Trust that creation is bursting forth from you, whether it's the beautiful creation of the experience the two of you have together or something new. Um, Let's see, we have one more statement here. Um, I've been sexually discarded by my sex addict husband. I don't know, I didn't know this till a year ago. Um, I've always been eager for intimacy and sexuality and sorely missing it. It's been over two decades. I'm not yet divorced, but feel that I'm not willing to wait for him. I feel I need to start chatting in a dating mode explore for myself, seeing how I feel and recognize chemistry thoughts. Well, Taylor, I would encourage you to definitely um, start to explore your sensuality without necessarily running out. I mean, you're not divorced, so maybe running out and having sex with someone else could be curative for you, or it could make you feel worse. I don't know how to possibly advise you on that. You're gonna to have to use your own good sense with that. But a precursor to that would be to take stock of your physical body. Are you healthy? Um, are you exercising? Do you feel good about yourself? What makes you feel sexy, sensual? Um, maybe you want to throw out some old clothes and buy some new clothes or find a new look or do something with your hair. I, I don't know, because I don't know you at all. Um, but start to um, maybe go for a massage and do things that make you feel vibrant, alive, sensual, and sexy. Um, and figure out what turns you on, what makes you feel good about yourself. I agree, you shouldn't be waiting for him or anybody else to feel vital um, and sensual and sexually alive. So give that gift to yourself first. Um, maybe read some books that would be helpful that resonate for you at this stage of your life that you're in uh, before you start getting right onto dating sites. So it's important that you know who you are um, from this point of view, not for um, not dragging your past or your relationship into the next one, or even your anger at him or disappointment at him into a new relationship. Uh, what if the words shared by your betraying partner during lovemaking are super sexual in nature, new to our relationship and present only after disclosure, and it makes me physically ill? Well, I think you need to talk to him about that uh, because clearly that's non-consensual sex. He's saying or doing things that you don't um, you know, have any rapport or agreement about. So I think you need to talk to him about that. Um, it's not just about you getting over it. It's about a conversation about what about that is arousing to him. You have to be curious about it with him um, as, and notice you know, that it makes you ill as opposed to turned on. Well, what makes you sick about that? Is it because you don't trust that he's really into you? Um, but be careful about judging your partner and be much more curious with him or her about what exactly it is um, that's going on to see if you can bridge that gap. Um, I'm struggling with an obsession about what other people think about the choices I make in my own life, choices that I know that are best for me. I see myself trying to control the way these people think about me by over explaining or try to state my case when deep down I know it doesn't matter what they actually think. Well, my experience with that kind of self-consciousness is that it has to do with shame. So I would suggest you take a good look at your shame, the shame that you feel about whatever, yourself, um, and start to deconstruct that shame. Because what other people think of you, I mean, if you spend all of your time worrying about that, that's an incredible amount of self-consciousness that does not allow you to live in these vital, joyful ways that we've been talking about. I found a SLAA a little over a year ago. Since then, I'm practicing feeling my feelings and being honest with my day-to-day -day feelings. 
Um, this has taken a big toll on my relationship with my partner since I've suppressed so much over our 14 years together. We're now take, talking divorce. Any advice on moving forward with my healing while taking into consideration her feelings? Well, I would suggest if you haven't, that you certainly go to couples therapy and try to sort this out. But if your partner doesn't have a language for feelings and is not psychologically minded or interested, you're going to hit a dead end. Um, and that's really unfortunate because you have an opportunity to work things true, uh, work things through rather. Um, so I hope that you can um, definitely work this through with your partner by being in conversations with each other about what you both need and also find a professional that can help you. Um, Okay, what's the difference between sex addiction and infidelity? Well, I would suggest that you Google the answer to that question um, because it's a big, big answer. Um, and there's definitely distinctions. People that are sex addicts have a history, a longstanding history of multiple um, sexual experiences. And it's usually for years on end. Um, infidelity is typically a one-time event. Um, and so they really are different, but you should just Google sex addiction and um, you can also find the criteria for sex addiction online as well. Okay, so I think we did it today. I wanna to remind you that you can find um, this webinar and every other webinar we have on our YouTube channel. So you can listen to it again. Um, I believe that is in the chat box um, along with our social media platforms. Um, but you will find it on our YouTube channel at Center for Healthy Sex um, on YouTube. And typically these are posted a week after the actual webinar. All right, so for today, I hope you go forth, notice the emotions in your body. They're always there. And see if you can give expression to some feeling today. Meet a stranger with open heartedness, with a laugh. Um, spread the joy that whenever you can. And I hope you have a happy May and happy Mother's Day to all of you out there in whatever ways that you're mothering. And I look forward to seeing you in June.